Welcome to the Hearing Reviews webinar, Managing Returns for Credit with Dr. Jill Caseworm. I'm Carl Strum, editor of the Hearing Review magazine and its website at hearingreview.com. This is the third of a three webinar series brought to you courtesy of Care Credit, focusing on improving your marketing and practice management. Today's webinar looks at returns. for credit, what you can do to reduce them, and successful strategies that Dr. Caseworm has been using to get her returns for credit down to 1% in her practice. Our presenter, Dr. Jill Caseworm, AUD, is a well-known audiologist who has been the owner of Professional Hearing Services in St. Joseph, Michigan for over 30 years. Her office has been widely profiled in the hearing press for its forward-thinking design. She's contributed many articles to the Hearing Review, and I think many people in our industry often look to her business as something of a best practices benchmark. Today's presentation is brought to you by CareCredit, a health care credit card designed for patients' health, beauty, and wellness needs. It helps families access the care they need and want without delay or compromise. Approved patients with hearing problems can use it to pay for hearing tests, aids, and other preventive hearing devices they need to live their lives to the fullest. CareCredit is also offering at their 2015 IHS convention booth in Orlando a summary of Jill's presentations along with a special report and toolkit about the hearing industry and dispensing practice metrics. So if you're at IHS, be sure to stop by the CareCredit booth, that's booth 308, and pick these up. They'll also be offering a similar toolkit at the ADA convention in Washington, so stay tuned for that. As a matter of housekeeping in this webinar, you can email Jill and me questions via the Q&A box on the left or by using the email address shown at the end of this presentation. I'm also obligated to point out the standard ever-present legal disclaimer, which essentially says you are urged to consult with financial, legal, and other advisors relative to this content, and there's no implied liability for the use of the information provided. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Jill Caseworm to today's Hearing Review webinar. Jill? Thank you for that wonderful introduction, Carl. I would also like to thank my colleagues and friends at Care Credit for inviting me to do this seminar. I'm really excited to talk about the return for credit topic because I think it's something that is overlooked sometimes in many practices. We just kind of take it for granted that we'll have them. And it's something that can really affect the business, not only profitability, but patient satisfaction. So I'm going to tell you a few things that we've used in my practice to get our return for credit rate down to 1%. The first place to start is tracking. If you don't know where you've been, you don't know where you're going. And that's the number one thing I find in this profession is most people don't track the key performance indicators in their businesses. The first thing is, of course, to track help rate, which I talk about so often, the percentage of patients that need hearing aids versus the percentage of patients that actually purchase hearing aids. But you certainly want to track also the people that do return for credit because it can really affect the business. And I've also heard that there are as many as 4 million people in the United States alone who don't get hearing aids because they've tried them and didn't like them or know someone who has tried them and returned them for credit. So it's something we really need to focus on and really try to reduce because it is quite high in this industry. I can tell you that I never paid much attention to it. Of course, I didn't like it. But when I started tracking it, I thought, oh, my, our return for credit rate was way too high. So we thought about what we're saying. I'm going to talk about some of those things. And we got ours down, as I mentioned in the beginning, to 1%, which is really great. So if I can do it, you can do it too. So let me tell you about some of the things that we've done. First industry is 17%. Now just imagine, we convince less than half the people to go ahead and get help for their problem and then return 17% of that. It's really too high. So all you have to do is focus on it, track it, and start thinking about and investigating why it's so high, why people bring them back, and then really look at ways to reduce it. Then that's working with a business recently, a very large business actually, and they were quite exasperated because their return for credit rate was over 25%, which was huge. I know another person whose return for credit rate was even higher than that. But when they started investigating, they found out that the people fitting the hearing aids, the hearing healthcare professionals, were saying things like, well, if you don't like it, you can bring it back. And they were focusing more on the if you don't like it than they were on how it's going to be so successful for them and what it's going to do to help them understand better in difficult listening situations or how they're going to benefit. They were focusing on if you don't like it instead of this is going to be so great. So think about what you're saying to patients 
I remember in the early days in my career, which was a very long time ago, I would actually schedule patients at 30 days and ask them, would you like to keep these AIDS? Now think about that. We've already identified that a patient has a problem. They've already admitted that it's affecting their quality of life. So why would returning even be an option? Aren't you willing to stick with it and do whatever you can to help these people hear better? Because that's what it's all about. It's what we're saying to the patients. So really, if you have to, record yourself and see what you're saying and what perception patients have of the hearing aids and how successful they might be. When you're working with a patient that has a hearing loss, and we all know they've waited three, six, eight, nine years before they've ever even made an appointment, let's face it, most of these patients already know that they have a hearing loss or at least suspect it, or they wouldn't take the steps to make that appointment in the first place. So when you're talking with that patient, don't just ask them questions like, when you first noticed it, have you been around noise, does anybody in your family have a loss? Ask them things that really affect their life. What types of problems are you having hearing people? When do you experience difficulty understanding others? And when you are in those situations, Mrs. Jones, where you're left out and can't participate with your family, how does that make you feel? Has this loss and the the feeling that you have that you're not hearing well kept you from participating in situations? Do you avoid going out to dinner or being with your family because you're having difficulty hearing? Really get to the heart of it. Sometimes I've heard patients, not patients, but professionals say, try to build the pain. Build the pain and get the patient, before you even do the testing, to try to admit to the fact that they are having problems. And then what is the patient looking for from you? I once heard a very respected professional who's great at convincing patients to get hearing aids. He said, if I can help you understand your grandchild or be able to hear that movie when you go with your wife? Is that the help you're looking for today? And he said that before he even did the testing. So he tried to pull out of the patient why they were there and what their goal for that appointment was so that he would know what to really focus on. When a patient says, yes, that's the help I'm looking for, basically they've already committed to getting help for their problem, which is what you want them to do. Now, first thing we can do to reduce returns for credit is to focus on the obstacles we all hear every day from our patients and to try to do something about them. One of the first obstacles that I seem to hear in my office, yes, I know I may have a problem, but I need to talk to my spouse about it. So why not try to overcome that obstacle before you even start? When you make the appointment and when you confirm the appointment, ask for someone to come with them. Now, I have found it's a little bit more difficult to get that third party to come with patients when I'm working with baby boomers because they're all very busy and they don't always want to bring somebody with them or don't see the need. Well, the thing is, what we're doing is really not about testing someone's hearing. It's about communication. That takes two people, right? So it's so important not just for the confirmation that a person has a problem by their spouse or significant other or their family member, but it's really about communication and how if we do have a hearing loss or if someone does have difficulty understanding, how two people can communicate better to overcome that problem. It's not just about hearing aids. So if you can get that third party to come up front, it's going to be a much better consultation, and you'll probably have a lot more people saying, yes, they want to go ahead and do something about their problem. It also gets someone else to listen and really hear what you're saying about that problem and to help the other person decide if they want to do something about the problem. Care Credit have done some great research recently on the path to purchasing hearing aids and the things to know. Well, one of the things they found is that, of course, hearing care is a quality of life issue, But it's also about money. That's the second most common complaint that I seem to hear. And when we send out surveys to people that need hearing aids and decide they don't want to get help for their problem or they don't want to purchase hearing aids, we send a survey then and ask them why they didn't do something about it. And 90% of those patients say it's because of money. Now, the question is, is it that they don't have the money, they don't want to part with the money, or they don't think it's worth the money? Well, all of those things can be helped by offering financing. 
money is an issue for patients. I don't know about you, but most people, including myself, don't have thousands of dollars just sitting around waiting to be spent. People don't like to part with their money. They don't like to take money out of investments or whatever. So when you offer financing, it makes things so much easier for patients. And most patients, when they come to our offices, don't even know it's available. So certainly it's a good idea to advertise that you offer financing. And if you have a sheet with pricing on it, make sure you say to patients or list even on the sheet that no interest financing available. It really does cause more patients to take advantage of the help you're offering and to do something about their problem. And most patients search on the Internet when they're looking for information about hearing loss or about your practice or the organization that you work in. Care Credit also did some recent research that said that 56% of people coming in for a hearing test talk to their family or friends before they ever make that appointment. And then this slide gives a great depiction of where people look for information. And, of course, search engines are one of them. So on your website, you should say that you offer financing and make it like a little bullet point and even have people click on it. They could even go and probably get pre-approved for financing from your website if they'd like to do that because you can put a link to Care Credit right from your website. When we're talking about websites, you also want to make sure that there's good information about you and your business out there and that you post testimonials to also help patients feel comfortable before they ever come in about your organization and about possibly getting help for their problem. So certainly advertising that you offer a finance plan and a no interest finance plan has been proven to increase the percentage of patients that will get help for their hearing loss today and also the amount of patients that will keep their hearing aids. If they've already gone through the process and committed to financing and signed up for it and gone ahead with the purchase of hearing aids, they're a lot less likely to return them for credit. I think one of the biggest obstacles to people keeping their hearing aids are these risk-free trials. As a business person, I can tell you that there's nothing risk-free about a trial. One of my audiologists was working with a patient, and we don't typically do free trials. We ask for people to confirm and to pay up front for their hearing aids. Certainly, we offer an adjustment period, but we don't talk about trials and we don't talk about free anything because we all know that an initial period of patients getting used to hearing aid takes time. It takes energy, and patients need to be committed to that. So if a patient says to me, can I return these for credit if I don't like them? I say, you know what? I think we better back up here a minute. We've already talked about and you've shared the places where you're having difficulty understanding You've discussed that your hearing loss is affecting your quality of life. We've diagnosed a significant problem here and demonstrated that you can be helped with the use of hearing aids. So if you're already asking me if you can bring something back, maybe this isn't the time to do something about it. You want people to be committed up front. And I know many hearing health care practitioners that send all their hearing aids out free trial. Just go out and try them. What are we saying to patients if we say go out and try it? To me, the word try means we don't know if it works. We're professionals. I know if it's going to work. You know if it's going to work. And it's our job to convince patients that it's going to work. Certainly, it's not going to be easy and there may have to be adjustments, but we let our patients know that we're committed to the process and they have to be committed to that process too. My friends in the industry have told me that if AIDS are put out on a free trial and no money down, 65% of those AIDS will come back and be returned, and you'll have to return the AIDS for credit. Also, think about what putting AIDS out on a free trial means to you and your cash flow. If you have to pay for your products and patients aren't paying you, that can really put a kink in your cash flow. Also, in today's environment with the great softwares that we have, we should be showing patients what it's like to hear better and not just telling them what it's like. When a patient loses their hearing, we know it's a very slow and gradual process, and many patients have no idea what it's like to hear better. So we have a great process that we use in my practice. We always demonstrate the need for amplification, and then we demonstrate the benefits of better hearing. So how many times have you put a person in a soundproof booth presented words to them at an optimal listening level. They do very well, of course. 
And then you bring them out of that booth and you tell them they have a significant hearing loss and they say, how could that be? I heard everything in that booth. So what we need to do is tell patients that when we're in the booth, we're testing for their potential. We're going to make sure that we're seeing how well a patient can hear if things are loud enough for them. Then bring them in to a normal listening environment, whether that's, you know, just in a room with no, not in a sound field, but just in a room and you have a speaker three feet in front of them. And then use recorded words and illustrate the handicap that they're experiencing. You can do that by having a speaker just three feet in front of the patient and say, now we've tested you in the booth. We know your potential for good hearing. Now we're going to see how well you're really hearing in real life because we don't live in soundproof rooms and it's not always possible to turn everybody up. And then what we do is we use those recorded words and we present them to the patient at a normal listening level, 40 to 45 dB HL. And hopefully that third party is sitting over there listening to what the patient is missing. And then we just ask them to repeat the words. And, of course, if they do have a hearing loss, they're not going to hear well at normal listening levels at 45 or 40 dB HL. And then I keep track of all the words that the patient misses. And I show them. They say, how do you feel like you did on that? Well, maybe not so good. That's right. Let me just show you. Well, in the booth, you got 88%, so we know that's your potential. But here with normal voices and at a normal listening level, you're only getting 45%. It can have an impact on the patient so they can see and hear what they're missing. In today's wireless world, it's possible to have the aids there, to shut the battery doors. If you're already in their file or whatever, you can program them, hang them on the patient, and then do exactly the same thing. Then you're demonstrating to the patient what the potential is for hearing better with hearing aids. At this point, if you have a third party sitting close by, you can have them read words to them, to the patient, or you can use those same recorded words and use a similar list and do it all over again. This will go a long way at the patient really understanding what they're missing and how well they could be hearing. So illustrate the handicap and demonstrate the benefits so the patient has some idea of what to expect. And, of course, a lot of this, convincing patients to get the benefits of better hearing and then keeping them, of course, is building a solid relationship and letting patients know that you're there for the long haul. You're not just there for the short term. You're there for the long haul. You're there to work with them. You're there to help them hear better and to do whatever it takes so that they'll be hearing better and enjoying the benefits of the hearing aid and really feeling like they're getting their money's worth. I don't think most people want to bring their hearing aids back for credit. I think when people go through all of this and the appointment and taking the time and the fitting, they want to hear better, but we have to give them realistic expectations, and that can be done in that initial consultation. And then let the patients know, hey, I'm here for the long haul. If you have problems, I'm here for you. And it really helps to call the day after the fitting so you can flush out any possible complaints that may cause a patient to bring the hearing aids back. If you call them right away and if they are having difficulty, you can have them come in sooner than their scheduled appointment. And you can also reassure them that the first few days is the toughest. They just need to put them in and wear them and get used to them. Their hearing loss did not happen overnight, and they will not get used to hearing aids overnight. So just to summarize what I've talked about here in reducing returns for credit is don't just tell the patient about their hearing loss. Really show them what that hearing loss is doing to their ability to understand. Use recorded words. Do testing at a normal listening level if they have a high frequency loss. Make sure you use either the NU6 by difficulty or a high frequency word list to really let the patient experience the hearing loss and then put hearing aids on them and demonstrate the benefit. As I mentioned, call the day after the fitting. We found that that really helps to reduce returns for credit. Get your money up front. Don't put those aids out on a free trial because it will affect your cash flow and your business. Time is money. There's nothing free about a trial. Choose your words wisely. Really think about and listen to what you're saying to patients. Are you talking about you're going to try this as if you don't know if it's going to help? Or are you telling patients that you're there for the long haul and you're going to walk them through the process? It's not going to be an easy one, but they will be able to adjust and the benefits will be worth that effort in the initial time that they're getting used to the hearing aids. The hearing aid didn't happen overnight. They're not going to get used to it overnight. And finally, use happy patients to spread the word of the benefits of amplification. You know, most of my patients today with the great technology are very happy and very satisfied. But you've probably heard the 
expression that happy patients tell no one and unhappy patients tell everyone. So really solicit those testimonials, put them on your website, make sure your website has a link to a great resource like Care Credit or at least information. Focus on the fact that you offer low interest or no interest financing. It will make a difference in people not only purchasing, but in keeping their hearing aids. I want to thank Carl again from Hearing Review and also my friends at Care Credit. I hope you found this seminar helpful, and I would welcome any kind of comments or questions at one of my social media sites. I've really enjoyed this presentation and hope you have too. Thanks for the great information, Jill. If you have questions for Dr. Caseworm, you can email her at the email address shown here. As I mentioned before, CareCredit is also offering a free toolkit as well as a summary of the information contained in this webinar at its booth, booth number 308, at the 2015 IHS convention in Orlando. So please stop by and pick up this material if you're attending the convention. They will also be offering a different series of webinars and the toolkit in advance of the 2015 ADA convention, so stay tuned for that. I'd like to thank Dr. Jill Caseworm and Care Credit for their participation in this webinar, and also Hearing Review staff members Dana McLean, Courtney Riley, and Ashley Lawson for their help in producing it. For the Hearing Review, I'm Carl Strum. Thanks for watching.